good morning, or whatever time of day it is for you right now, and thank you for joining us. I'm guessing that if you're here, you either feel like you're a weirdo, or you deal with a lot of people who seem like weirdos to you. Either way, if you ultimately want to get better at communicating with people who are different than you are, you are in the right place. I'm Jeremy, and I've been called weird many times in my life, and I generally agree. But what I've found, in fact, is that everyone's a weirdo. We all communicate very differently, and once we recognize that, we can find ways to make conversations easier, which is going to help make things better at work, with your family and friends, or any social interaction. I'm glad you are taking this journey with us, so let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to How to Talk to Weirdos, where it's our ongoing quest to overcome some of the many obstacles that cause poor communication between people. Today, we have a very special guest on our show. I'm excited to introduce Matt Abrahams. Matt is a leading expert in communication. He's a lecturer at Stanford University School of Business. He's a keynote speaker and a communication consultant. He hosts his own very popular podcast called Think Fast, Talk Smart. And he's the author of Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. And his second book, Think Faster, Talk, Talk Smarter, is gonna be available tomorrow. So I've gone on Amazon. It can be pre-ordered, so I recommend everyone go ahead and do that. Matt, welcome. Jeremy, thank you. I am super excited to chat with you about communication, and I appreciate all of the uh, introduction you just gave. I actually had to shorten it a little bit. You've done so many good things, I had to pick and choose. Oh, well, thank you. I, shorter is better. <laughs> so congratulations on the second book. I know that's no small task. What made you decide to write it? It was a bo book born out of necessity, actually. You know, the two things happened to, to lead to this book. One, uh, about nine years ago, the deans at the Stanford Graduate School of Business came to me and said, we have a problem. The problem is our incredibly bright students are panicking and not able to answer those cold calls. You know, when the professor says, what do you think? And you have to respond. Yeah. And at the same time, many of my students were leaving my class saying, thank you for all these tips on strategic communication. But I'm finding that I really struggle in the moment when somebody asks a question, asks me for feedback, I have to make small talk. So the combination of those two together led me to dive deep into this notion of what I call spontaneous speaking, how to speak in the moment. And the book is a result of that work. Great. Can you tell us a little more about what you mean by spontaneous speaking? Just sure. so that we're all on the same page. Absolutely. So most of our communication is in the moment. People ask us questions, we make a mistake, we have to fix it, we're, we have to make small talk. And yet, if we take any kind of communication training, it's always around planned communication. You're crafting a presentation, you're designing a pitch, you're leading a meeting. All of those are planned, and those are very important high-stakes situations. Absolutely, I've spent a lot of my career helping people for those planned circumstances. But it's the in-the-moment, interactive, communication that I'm really focusing on now. And that's what the book Think Faster, Talk Smarter is all about. Why is spontaneous communication such a challenge for most people? Well, I think most communication is challenging for people because we want to get it right. We want to do it the best we can. And in spontaneous situ situations where you can't practice and rehearse in the same way you do for planned communication, that pressure to do it right, to do it well, uh, often can be overwhelming. That's not to forget that anxiety also looms large in these circumstances as well. Many of us get nervous in any kind of communication. So between the way we put pressure on ourselves to do well and the innate experience of anxiety, that, that gets in the way of spontaneous speaking. Yeah, how many times have people walked away from a conversation and said, oh, this is what I should have said? Exactly. Once you're out of that moment and that pressure is off, your brain begins to think differently and you start saying, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. And I address that in the book. You know, we have to it's important to reflect so we can learn, but we don't want to ruminate because rumination uh, doesn't help us in sports. They have this wonderful idea. It's called next play. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong, you don't dwell on it. You try to learn from it, but you move on to the next play. If you're a basketball player or a soccer player, you know, if you sit there ruminating on what you just did, the other team is taking the ball and might score. Uh, similarly, if you do something amazingly well, you don't gloat and bask in that glory. You've got to get back and do the work. So um, 
it, when we make mistakes and we say, oh, it could have been better or different, absolutely learn from it, but then get back into the, into the game. Yeah, if you're not careful, you take one mistake and you turn it into two or three or four. Exactly. Excellent. You know, um, I've talked on some of my other episodes about doing improv, and yeah. a very important thing at improv is active listening. And I know that you talk about how important that is. Do you have any tips or tricks to help people be more attentive listeners? I sure do. I, I just want to give a, a big shout out to improvisation. I think improvisation is a great way to get better at communicating, but also to get better at just being a good person. Hmm. Improv is so full of valuable lessons. Many people are intimidated by it because we think of improv by what we see on TV and it's these people being amazingly funny in the moment. That's not what improv is about at all. Uh, that's one way you can take it, but improv is really about learning how to connect and as you said, listen. Uh, when it comes to listening, you know, in all my years of doing communication work, I have come to learn more and more just how important listening is. We think of communication as speaking, but we should really focus on listening more. I borrow a framework from a colleague of mine. His name is Collins Dobbs, and he teaches crucial, critical conversations. And he uses this notion of pace, space, and grace to help in those circumstances. And I, with his permission, I've leveraged that same framework to talk about listening. We don't listen very well. We listen just enough to get the gist of what somebody is saying. And then we begin rehearsing, evaluating, judging what we want to say. And if we do that, we might miss some nuance in the moment. So imagine, Jeremy, you and I are coming out of a meeting and you say, hey, Matt, how do you think that went? I immediately hear, Jeremy wants feedback. Well, Jeremy, this went okay, but you blew it over here and we should have done that. And I just itemize all these things that went wrong because I was thinking you asked for feedback. But had I really listened, I might have noticed you left through the back door, not the front door like I did. I might have noticed you were looking out the window and, and talking with a little less affect in your voice as you asked the question. I missed it. I missed that you were really asking for support because you felt it didn't go well. I just heard feedback, and so when I piled on all this negative, constructive feedback, I did not help that situation at all. In fact, I probably made it worse. So we need to listen, and by giving ourselves a little pace, space, and grace, we can do that. So by pace, I mean slow down. Life comes at us very quickly, and we need to actually just slow down and be present to listen, and improv teaches a lot of that. Then we have to give ourselves space. Maybe that's physical space. We, we move to a place where I can actually hear you better or mental space. We are constantly negotiating so many things that are striving for our attention. I have to allocate this mental space to really listen to what you're saying. And then finally, grace. Grace to give myself permission to listen and realize that listening is a way of connecting, but also to give myself permission to listen to my intuition that comes up as I hear from you. So a little bit of pace, space, and grace will make all of us better listeners. I like that that has both rhyme and alliteration in it. That, that's a whole And I like for both. Me. And I like both. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm yes. a big fan of both. Yes. Yeah. You know, one thing that happens at improv all the time is people feel so pressured to do the next thing. And when you watch people who are really good at it, there are pauses in there. And pauses are okay. It's all right to have some quiet downtime. In between one of my favorite sayings from improv everybody knows yes and right but one of my favorite sayings from improv is don't just do something stand there i love it right yeah. it's that notion of sometimes the most important thing you can do is nothing and just be present and listen right i like it and yeah you know it, that's the case in art too sometimes it's what's not there or the blank spaces that are just so important i love it um so you are a communications expert, and when people find that out, are there one or two questions that you get over and over again? I really, it's hard for me to hear when people say I'm an expert. You know, I have two teenagers and a wife, and, and they will find, they, they will contradict that statement. <laughs> um, I am often asked several, several questions. Uh, the, the two most frequent questions I get asked are, one, what do I do with my hands? Everybody wants to know, what do you do with your hands when you speak? And, and I say, use them. Um, <laughs> I'll give you my quick answer to that question. 
When you're not speaking, make sure your hands are, are visible but not distracting. So we don't put them in our pockets, we don't put them under the table, we don't futz and fiddle with things. And when you do speak and use your hands, go beyond your shoulders. Many of us, when we get nervous, we gesture in front of our chest, it's defensive, it looks like we're praying. Go beyond your shoulders. And it doesn't have to be very far beyond your shoulders, but just have your hands go a little bit beyond your shoulder. The second question I get has to do with anxiety, and it is, what do I do if I blank out? Everybody is so afraid of blanking out. And in fact, there's some research that says the fear of blanking out increases the likelihood that you will blank out. Well, so there's that's some things not helpful. Need... No, no, that's not good. So, so two things that I suggest to people to do if you're afraid of blank blanking out. One is rationalize. Our fear is often irrational when it comes to blanking out. So I have people ask themselves two questions. For the next communication I'm doing, what is the likelihood that I will blank out on a scale of zero to 100? 100%, I will absolutely blank out. 0%, no way I'll blank out. Most people, if they're honest with themselves, will come in around 20%. They'll say, there's a 20% chance I'll blank out. And I, and I encourage them to realize that means there's an 80% chance that you won't. Those are some good odds. And then the second question I ask is, if you were to blank out, what is the worst thing that would happen for you? And people itemize, oh, I'd be embarrassed, it would be awkward, it might be, uh, it affect my career in the short term. But then I ask them, have you ever embarrassed yourself in front of others before? Have you ever made others feel awkward? And everybody says, yes, of course. And then I point out, you've survived. So we take away some of that bite that that fear has by rationalizing. And then the other thing that's really important, and I hope we get a chance to talk about this, is the notion of structure. Structure is key to any communication, but especially spontaneous communication, because it provides a roadmap. And if you have a structure in mind and you blank out, you can always refer back to the map. So if I'm doing a speech that's problem, solution, benefit, I'm pitching something, and I blank out right after I say the problem, I know that solution always follows it, so I'm back on track. So those are the two questions I get. What do I do with my hands and how do I not blank out? And there's some su suggestions on how to manage both. And when you do blank out, it's not yeah. really that big a problem. Everyone does it. There's no one who hasn't ever done it. And right. you know what I'll tell people, and I've heard this often, when you're doing a presentation, the audience wants you to succeed. Yes. They're on your side. So they're willing to cut you some slack. Just cut yourself some slack as well. Absolutely. And if you blank out, do two things. Repeat yourself. Often saying what we just said gets us back on track. And if that doesn't work, distract your audience. Ask a question. I sometimes blank out when I teach. So I'm going to let all of your listeners in on a little secret. If you ever see me teach and I say the following, let's pause for a moment and think about how what we've just discussed can affect your life. When I say that, it means I need a little bit of break to think about what comes next because I've forgotten. My audience doesn't think that. They think, wow, I should really think about how this applies for my life, or he really cares about this topic and he wants me to apply it. All of us can have a back pocket question that we can ask that will get our audience distracted, yet in a way that's relevant to what we're saying, to allow ourselves to get back on track. That is brilliant, but now everybody knows your secret. Well, I know, so I'll have to come <laughs> up with another question. I've also seen people very successfully just admit that they've blanked out say, huh, I totally lost my, uh, you know, my frame of reference or where I was. Give me a second. And people let it go. They do. People are very kind. Your audiences want you to succeed. I will, uh, if you'll allow me, I want to be a little contradictory, though. I am not a big fan of pointing out mistakes that we make uh, because we then get people focusing on the mistake rather than on the message. Here's a clear example of that. Many nervous speakers want to admit they're nervous up front because yeah. they think it buys them a little bit of extra sympathy and empathy. What it really does is it has everybody fixate on everything you do that signals you're nervous because you're now priming everybody to see it. So I, I advise people just to present. I advise people to, if you make a mistake or, or if you forget, to, to try to recover without calling a lot of attention to it. I'm not saying that that's always the best advice, but, but I don't want us to then distract our audience or prime our audience to be distracted. Yeah, I, anytime someone starts with, uh, you know, I'm really nervous, like, oh, this isn't gonna go great. Yeah, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's right. So it's all right to be nervous. Just don't say it. You, no one else yes. needs to know. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's normal to be nervous. 
right? No matter how often you do it. That's exactly right. A couple of minutes ago, you said that you would like to go more into a topic. Um, yeah. So On this is your opportunity to go back into structure. Thank you. Yeah, so when it comes to spontaneous speaking, I, I've devised a six-step methodology that really abstracts to two things. We've got to focus on mindset and message. And when it comes to message, we really need to structure our communication. And by structure, I mean simply a logical connection of ideas. Most of us, when we speak, especially nervous, especially in the moment, we tend just to list out information. Our brains are not wired for lists. We can't remember many things. You know, in presentations, people put lots of bullet points. Bullets kill, don't kill your audience with bullet points. <laughs> Rather, one. structure information in a meaningful way. Structure implies a beginning, a middle, and an end. Our brains are wired for input of structure. In fact, long-term memory is also called episodic memory, episodes, beginning, middle, end. So if you can become comfortable with certain structures, then it helps you when you have to speak. A structure is like a map, or I sometimes I'll say like a recipe. I can be a good cook if I have a good recipe, right? When if I'm left on my own, I, I'm not such a great cook. So there's several structures that you can use. And in the second part of the, the new book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, I list six different situations that many of us find ourselves in, small talk, apologizing, etc., and give structures that can be used to help you in those. So let me give you an example. I've already talked about problem, solution, benefit. Imagine that you are in a circumstance where you have to give some feedback. Somebody asks you for feedback. A great way to do that is to structure it in what I call the, the best question-based structure ever. What, so what, now what? What is your feedback? So what is why is it, it's important, and now what is what you'd like somebody to do next? So imagine you ask me for feedback. I might say, hey, the meeting went great, except when you talked about the implementation plan. You spoke quickly and did not give a lot of details. That's the what. When you speak quickly without details, People think you're not as prepared. That's the so what. That's why that's important. Next time, slow down, and I'd like you to include these two specific examples when you talk about the implementation plan. That's the now what. So in the moment, when you ask me for feedback, I know how I'm going to give you the feedback. What, so what, now what? I just have to think about what to put into that feedback so my life is easier. And by the way, I think it packages it up very nicely for you to receive rather than just a list of information. So that's the value of structure and you can practice structure and you can become more comfortable with it. I like that it gives you something to do, not just information, but the next steps to take. That's always helpful. Exactly, that's right. So a common one, which maybe people will be interested in hearing is, you know, I've been at celebrations, whether it's a birthday or a dinner for someone congratulating them and they are spontaneously asked to, why don't you just say a few words? <laughs> thinking that, you know, it's a great thing for them that they get to say a few words and it, it rarely looks like they're enjoying it and it rarely goes well. Do you have an, a structure for that? Yes. So if you're asked to give a toast or a tribute, uh, I have a structure that, that's called what? W-H-A-T. What? So first is the W is why are we all here? Right. So so you comment on the, the occasion. Maybe it's a new product release and you're celebrating it. Maybe it's somebody's quinceanera, bar mitzvah, wedding, uh, something of that nature. So you, you, you explain why we're all here. Then the H of what is how are you connected? In some circumstances, people know you're the senior leader of the team. You don't have to say we're here to celebrate the launch of our new product. And I'm the director of the group. Everybody knows that. But if you're at a wedding, for example, people might not know that you're the best man or you've known the, the bride for 20 years. So, so how are you connected to the event? And then you give an anecdote or two. That's what the A stands for. Tell a quick story or two. Emphasis on quick. We've all been part of toasts and tributes that went on too long. The, the anecdote should be applicable to everybody. Remember, it's a toast and tribute, not a roast. <laughs> and then the final part, the T, is some kind of thank gratitude, thanking, or toasting that you do in the moment. So there has to be a conclusion. I don't know about you, Jeremy, but I have seen a number of toasts where people don't know how to end, and it just kind of like keeps going on, and then it's like, uh, okay, great, thanks. So have a prepared or, or, or th a thoughtful way to end. So what? Why are we here? How are you connected? Anecdote or two, and then some kind of toast or tribute to end. 
Yeah, that end is so important in presentations. People always think about the hook and how they're going to start. And yeah. very often they don't think about how to end it. And then it just fizzles. Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, okay, I guess we're done. Or somebody else needs the room. That's my favorite way to end. Oh, I guess somebody needs the room. <laughs> That's not a conclusion. Sometimes as the audience, I have tried to be kind by starting to clap so that everyone yes. would clap and it ends it for them because it wasn't going to get any better. Yes, you are very kind. I have done the same. Or sometimes I'll ask a question and say, oh, are you open for some questions now? And, and that sort of gives a sense of closure. Yeah. Nice. You mentioned back in the beginning that your wife and kids may not consider you an expert at communication. <laughs> are there some things that in this journey have been particularly helpful for you that maybe you struggled with when you were younger and then through the research has really helped you personally? Thank you for that question. Uh, I, I have never been asked that question that way, and I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share a few things with you. Uh, one, slowing down, and I still struggle with this. Uh, I am a very fast thinker, and that is helpful in many ways. But it also means I miss nuance, and I make assumptions. And so one of the things that I have worked on and continue to work on is slowing down, being present, and that's why I think I gravitate towards improv. Uh, I do a lot of martial arts. Uh, these are all things that force me to be present. I'm trying to learn to play the guitar. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I learned earlier in my career, when I, before, I was, uh, before I came back to academics and, and teach, I, I ran organizations. I was a leader of learning and development, had lots of people reporting to me. And very early on in my career, I just wanted to be liked. I wanted everybody to like me. And that led me to be um, taken advantage of, to take on more work than I should, not to delegate. And so something I learned early that was really helpful for me personally and my communication was to put a priority on being respected and trusted rather than being liked. And it turns out if people respect you and trust you, they often will like you. But just because they like you doesn't mean they respect and trust you. So, so those were two big lessons that I've learned. Uh, I'm still working on the, the being present one for sure. I coach a lot of new managers, and one thing I will tell them is if your employees don't like you, they will be much happier if they know what to expect. If yes. you are consistent and they respect what you have to say, even if they don't like it, they are much happier than if they like you, but they, you're inconsistent and they don't know what's coming next. I, I love that advice. Very wise. I will tell you one thing that I struggle with still, and maybe sure. you can help me out with it. Huh. I talk slower than a lot of other people, and I don't talk as much. So if I'm in a group setting, everybody tends to start talking before the last person's done, which I really don't like to do. And so I have a really hard time wedging my way in there. And then sometimes I'll be talking. I won't be done yet, but I'll pause, and then someone will jump in. So how, how can I better navigate that? So there are two sides of that equation, and let me address both. And, and I, I, I actually, what you do, being thoughtful and letting people finish is, is really a gift. Uh, and it invites people to say more than they might normally if you give that little pause before you respond. So it's not all bad by any means. Wedging your way into a conversation is hard. There are a couple ways I advise people do it. One is to lead with a question. So if people are all talking and you want to get your voice heard, lead with a question. How are we going to deal with cost? What does this mean for the bottom line? By starting with a question while in the midst of a conversation, it gives you permission to continue your thought. Second, lead with an emotion. I'm concerned about that. Or that excites me. That again gives you permission to continue. And then third, this is perhaps one of the most valuable communication skills from my perspective is paraphrasing. If you can extract something of value that others have been talking about and you name it, that's your entry point into the conversation. So you might say implementing is really important. And in fact, my thoughts are this. So they had just been talking about the implementation plan or the challenges. So you start one way is questioning. 
One way is leading with emotion, another way is leading through paraphrasing. So that's how you can get your voice heard. Maintaining the floor while speaking so others don't jump in. Interestingly, I interviewed on my podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart, uh, a woman who is a neuro-linguist. And we talked about filler words, ums and uhs, why do we do them? You know, I've always been of the mind we should get rid of them. She actually convinced me they serve many purposes. And one of them is to maintain, maintain the floor. Oh. I'm not saying you should say um as you're beginning to, to think of what's saying next. But what it tells us is there are ways that we can signal we're not done when we want to keep talking. And we can do those verbally by saying something. We could literally say, hold on a sec, there's more I'd like to say. Or we could do a filler word. Or through our nonverbal presence, we can stay forward. We can keep gesturing. Something to signal we're not done yet. The last thing I'll say is there are people who speak slowly who want to speak faster. That might not be your case. But if it is, the way we sync up our gesturing speed with our speaking speed, our rates of speaking and gesturing are synced. So if you're a fast talker, you, you gesture fast. You tend to. It's hard to slow your speaking rate, but you can slow your gestures down. So if I ever work with a fast talker, I will ask them to slow their gestures down or make them more broad because that takes a little more time. It slows you down. The opposite is also true. If you want to speed up, gesture more quickly and you will tend to speak more quickly. If you gesture broadly, gesture a little tighter, that will help you speak more quickly. I said a lot there, Jeremy. I hope some of that might be useful to you. Yes, and luckily it's being recorded, so I can re-listen to it as well. You know, yes. I will tell you that, honestly, if I'm in a conversation and there are people I know and I can't get a word in, I raise my hand and it makes yeah. everyone laugh at me. But they all, yeah. they're like, Jeremy's got next. I'm like, great. Yeah. And then I'll just No, it's great. It's like, right, it's like shouting shotgun before you get in a car, right? It, it, yeah. it puts you in that first seat. So I, I love that you do that. Now, the key point that you said there is it's people you know. It would be a little off-putting, perhaps, if you did that with people you didn't know. Right. Um, and going back to talking about silence and getting people to say more than they might have otherwise, my mother was a master at that. I'm the youngest of 10 kids, so she learned. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. She learned how to get the information that she wanted out of us. And she would ask a question, and we would answer it. And I would always hope that she would kind of ask a follow-up question about what I said because I knew I could lead her down whatever path I would set up. And she would just sit there and wait. And then oh. I would say what the thing that was on the top of my mind was, which is, what was usually going to get me in trouble and you just yeah. you can't resist it people can't resist the silence i can't believe you have nine brothers and sisters and your mother sounds like she could work for the uh, cia <laughs> yeah it was a little bit militaristic there's one story i'll tell you when we were all little kids they we all went over to someone else's house and there were three families everyone had a bunch of kids and all the kids were just running around and it was dinner time. So my mother just yelled, my kids sit. And everybody <laughs> stopped running and sat down in the spot they were at and looked at her to wait. And all the other parents were like, how did you do that? She's like, you have to, you have to maintain control of all these. So. Oh my goodness, how amazing. Uh, I, have, I have so much respect for parents who, who do that in, in a way that's polite and kind. And it's just like, Kindergarten, te I think middle school and kindergarten teachers like your mother, you just described, there's a special place in heaven for them because they, <laughs> they've got that ability to stay calm, but manage things. I, I, I utmost respect. Yeah, she did good. Yeah. All right. Before we wrap up, I like to ask three questions of everybody. And the first one is what's a favorite place that you've traveled to and what's a place you would like to go? Thank you. I'm going to share my place of Zen. I, I love Sydney, Australia. It is my favorite city. There is a place, the Botanical Gardens in Sydney uh, is right next to the Opera House. Many people are familiar with the Opera House and maybe the Harbor Bridge. In the Botanical Gardens, there is a tree. It is a gnarly old tree. I love it. It's beautiful. I will stare at it and then I will turn around and I will see the Sydney Opera House in the Harbor Bridge and at sunrise or sunset, it is exquisite. So that is my favorite place in the world to visit. I do not get there enough. A place I would like to visit, I have always wanted to go to Portugal. 
I've never been. I've heard people who have gone. I hear it's, uh, it has some similarities to California, where I'm from, and I've just always wanted to, to visit Portugal. I have heard so many good things about Portugal. I'm in Rhode Island, and there are a lot of Portuguese people here, so I know a lot of people who go back there regularly. So yeah. I, I do highly recommend it. Who is a person who you think is a great communicator, and it could be someone in your personal life or a public figure? There is a woman. Her name is Brittany Packnett. She is a young woman, and she is amazingly powerful. And what I what I love about she talks about confidence. I talk a lot about confidence in terms of communication. She talks about confidence more broadly. So I love her message. She's got a lot of energy and passion. She's a great storyteller, and she leverages structure beautifully. So I, I encourage anybody. She's got a great TED talk. She has other talks out there. Again, her name is Brittany Packnett. Spell that, please. P-A-C-K-N-E-T, PACnet. Great. Thank you. And what is one tip that you'd like to give everyone about how they can be a better communicator? The biggest mistake people make in their communication is they start from the wrong place. They start by thinking about, here is what I want to say. It's about your audience. It's not about what you want to say. It's about what they need to hear. If everybody were to just take a few moments to reflect on what's important, relevant, and salient to your audience that will make a huge difference in all of our communication. That's a good one. I often ask myself and encourage other people to ask, so what? I just yeah. told you good information, but so what? What's it going to do? So that's wonderful. Great. Thank you so much. And how can people learn more about you, find out about your book, or where can they reach out? Thank you for the opportunity to share. I'm a huge user of LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, please make a connection to me. Uh, consider listening in to another communication podcast, just like Jeremy's, uh, Think Fast, Talk Smart. And you can find my book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, and lots of other resources at mattabrahams.com. Perfect. I do listen to your podcast, and it is I find it inspirational. So thank, thank you so you. much for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you, Jeremy. It was a true pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for listening to How to Talk to Weirdos. Check out my website at www.jeremydoranspeaks.com or follow us on LinkedIn or Instagram at Jeremy Doran Speaks, where you can get more great content or give feedback on what topics you'd like me to talk about next. Please follow How to Talk to Weirdos on your favorite podcast player to get our latest episodes. Until next week, go talk to some weirdos.